full impulse power. No, sir! You have Genesis! You can have whatever you... Full power! There it is! In 1982, Paramount Pictures faced a dilemma. They needed a composer for their sequel, Star Trek II, Wrath of Khan, but they could no longer afford the current composer, the magical, the amazing Jerry Goldsmith. They decided to turn to an unproven, unknown 29-year-old composer named James Horner. That decision would kickstart an unparalleled composing career by one of Hollywood's brightest minds. James Horner needs little introduction. His iconic movie scores include A Beautiful Mind, Legends of the Fall, Apollo 13, and the list goes on and on. He frequently collaborated with directors like Ron Howard, but it's his other partnership with James Cameron that led to record-breaking success. Their partnership was almost short-lived, however, as their first film together, Aliens, in 1986, frustrated Horner as he cited Cameron's film schedule and lack of time to adequately create a sufficient score as the reason for the tension. Horner recorded Alien in four short days and earned an Academy Award nomination nonetheless. That would be the end of their partnership, however, for a good decade until Cameron heard Horner's work on Braveheart in 1995. As we all were, Cameron was impressed, enough to offer him the musical spot on his newest project, Titanic, instead of his first choice, Enya. Can you imagine that? Horner, letting bygones be bygones, flew in and got to work. He styled the score similar to Enya's because he was impressed enough with her initial work on the film that he thought the style would stick. In an interview, he said he saw a rough cut of the film and wrote all the major themes for the movie in 20 minutes. I spent more time in a Wendy's drive-thru today than he did on the themes for Titanic. James Cameron told him initially he didn't want any particular songs or lyrical music in the movie, not even in the end credits. So, unbeknownst to Cameron, Horner wrote the song My Heart Will Go On with the help of Will Jennings. They sent it to Celine Dion, asking her to record a demo. With some persuasion, she agreed, sending the demo back to Horner after needing a mere one take to record her vocals. At least that's what they say and I'm not gonna doubt her. Eventually, they approached Cameron with the song, and he quickly approved placing the song in the movie, although he was still a little hesitant, worried that he would be criticized for going commercial at the end of the movie. Needless to say, the rest is history. Titanic went on to make more money than any movie ever had, and the score followed suit, becoming the highest selling orchestral film soundtrack of all time. My Heart Will Go On crushed everything in its path that year, winning the Oscar for Best Original Song, while Horner took home his second Oscar for Best Original Score. It was, in sports terms, utter and complete domination in 1998. Critics of Horner's work will always point to his use of recycling, as well in the case with Titanic. You can most definitely hear some recycled themes throughout that you heard three years previously in Braveheart, like in the track The Battle of Falkirk. We, however, are not ones to complain. James Horner, who tragically passed away in a plane crash in 2015, was one of the greatest to ever hold the baton. The man who, as Cameron stated in his tribute after his passing, was the heart of the film. And that's probably not even arguable. Thanks for watching this episode of The Blind Mole. If you liked it, be sure to subscribe and check out our other videos on the channel. Also, don't hesitate to comment, ask questions, or propose ideas for future videos.